It would have been a better that long than that movie. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church where we are on a mission to be for Jones County. Now because it's Labor Day weekend, we're not going to have small groups or 252 kids praise tonight, so take this time to enjoy the evenings with your families. Now here are some things coming up in the life of our church. Men, here at First Baptist Church, we are for Jones County, and I can't think of a better way to show support for our community than by supporting our phenomenal school system. This Wednesday, September the 5th, is Welcome Wednesday. We're asking that men in our churches all across our community will come and visit our school system on Wednesday morning. We want to welcome our students to school by being the presence of Jesus Christ, by being a smile to them, by being a fist pump, a handshake. Greet these students. Give them the love of Jesus as they go through their school day. So join us this Wednesday. I'll have sign-up sheets in the men's ministry table outside the sanctuary that you can sign up for what school you would like to go and support and visit for that day. But 7.30 this Wednesday, September the 5th, Welcome Wednesday, let's be the hands and feet and the presence of Jesus Christ throughout our community and support our local schools with Welcome Wednesday. Look to see you then. Good afternoon, First Baptist Church. I'm here at Greyhound Field, home of our Jones County Greyhound football team. And I want to invite you this Friday evening to join us as the men's ministry of First Baptist Church will sponsor this week's tailgate right out here on the practice field beginning at 5.30. We want to encourage you to come out and support our Jones County Greyhound football team as they're going to have a phenomenal season this year as they're off to a great start. Invite a man. Invite a couple, invite a family to join us for this great time and great football here in Jones County, right here on the practice field at 5.30. Two weeks from tonight, on September the 9th, we will have our quarterly family meeting. Groups will not meet that night, and we will all gather here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. Join us for a time of worship, communion, discussion on church matters, and fellowship over ice cream after church. Exploring First Baptist Church is coming up on September the 16th. This is a chance for new and potential members to get to know the heart and ministries of FBC Gray. You'll hear from ministry leaders as we share lunch after church, and child care will be available. So make sure that if this is something you would like to attend, be sure to register today on our website at firstbaptistgray.org. Here's a great way for our church to connect together. We all know that being the church doesn't just happen at church. It happens real time, in real life. But it's hard to stay connected. Busy lives, coming and going. But we need to stay together. We are the body of Christ. We each need the fellowship, the unity, and the support. So let's make that connection easier with the Connect app, just for our church. Once you download the free app, you can create your own personal profile. Keep it up to date with life changes and share it with others you choose. You can easily communicate with your small group, team, or other members. See upcoming Bible verse readings, offer encouragement, ask for prayer requests, volunteer, and more, all right from your phone. This is a great way to keep our church family in the loop on the important things happening in your life and help you stay connected with them. Keep up with all our events whether they're at church or not. Invite people to your next outreach project. Capture RSVPs, post a comment, and even see what they're bringing. And hey, good news. You can go ahead and recycle that outdated paper membership directory. Now you can look up members in our digital directory. See a new member at the park and can't quite remember their name? Pull up their details on your phone so you can say hi. 
Also, from their profile, you can give someone a quick call or email. That's easy. Giving your tithes and offerings is way easier now, too. You can even track your gifts to the church, set up recurring donations, and monitor progress toward your pledge goals. The best part is, you can do it all from anywhere, at any time, right from your phone. Our new Connect mobile app is a real ministry tool. It's going to help us a lot. Let's be the church, together. So download the app and let's get connected. One of you here, whoa, there we go, hello world. I'm, listen, be still, don't touch anything. Hands behind her back. All right, it's good to see each one of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are particularly glad that you're here. We hope that we make you feel at home this morning. Uh, it is Labor Day weekend, and a number of people are traveling all over the place. College football started back yesterday. Some of us are happy, some of us are sad, but that's what it is. Bo is preaching this morning. Uh, several people as I've come in have asked me, thought you weren't going to be here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Bo and Daniel both aspire to be senior pastors one of these days. Uh, you don't see too many 50-year-old student pastors, so uh, sort of a career path for Bo especially. So want to give them an opportunity to preach. Once a quarter, one of them will be speaking and didn't really think about it too awfully much when we first did it, but I was happy that it fell on the... Labor Day weekend for Bo. There you go. So Bo will be speaking to us this morning. Uh, just a couple of things I want to remind you of real quick. You saw in the announcements the uh, Exploring First Baptist. If you have been attending for a while or you're interested in knowing more about First Baptist, we're going to have that in a couple of weeks on the 16th. Going to try to answer any questions you might have. We're going to be telling a whole lot about the church. So I encourage you to come then. And the family meeting that's coming up next Sunday night. Uh, we'll be having communion, uh, special music. It'll be a good evening for worship and for the whole family to get together. And afterwards, we're going to have an ice cream social, so y'all come. Let's, uh, let's take a moment. Let's go to God in prayer as we uh, prepare our hearts for worship. Father, you are ever faithful. You are, Scripture says that you never change. Uh, the old hymn, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Lord, what you promise in your word is what you deliver. And I pray this morning, Lord, that as we hear your word through song and we hear your word through preaching, that we would, uh, that we would hear those promises of yours and we would hang on to them with everything that we've got. We know, Lord, that you love us and that you give us freedom, that you make us new. And Lord, in this hour, we want to worship you for that. I pray, Lord, that you help us to release all the things that hold us this week, all the things that make our heads spin, and for one hour, sit in your presence and be happy that you are our Lord and we are your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, and good morning to you. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad that you chose to worship with us at First Baptist. We have serve an incredible God, and he is worthy to be praised. So I invite you to stand and join us as we sing together. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all Oh. 
sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life.
and you can have a seat for a moment. You know, right in the middle of the Bible, God gives us a huge songbook, huge songbook, 150 psalms um, that the people that we read about in the scriptures, that was their hymn book. That's what they sang. That was what they sang together in corporate worship. And in Psalm 121, we hear the Lord say, or we hear it, sorry, hear the psalmist say, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So many promises. The Lord will do this. He will do that. And we, as his children, know that when the Lord makes a promise, he certainly keeps it. Even when we, like sheep, have gone astray, when we mess up bigger than we've ever messed up before, God still protects us. Even when we think he's the farthest away he's ever been, he is closer than we can even imagine because he loves us that much. Let's stand together as we continue singing and sing about that love that means so much to us.
Lord, this, this time of service where we give back a portion that you so graciously blessed us with. Lord, I pray that we will use these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom in this, this church. That we will we'll take these tithes and offerings and we will better your kingdom. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, go ahead and turn to Genesis uh, chapter 4. This June, Lacey and I will be, have been married for eight years. And one um, key that we've found to a, ha- a healthy relationship in eight years of marriage is having two TVs in our house. It just makes things easier, right? Um, We agree on a lot of things, but we can't usually agree on a television program. Um, So we we use the two TV system. There are certainly exceptions. I'll occasionally go down a flip or flop rabbit hole with Lacey or have a mini marathon of love it or list it. There's no shame in my game. I can admit that before church family. And uh, Lacey will occasionally sit and enjoy a Braves game with me, but nine times out of ten we use a two TV system because we have different preferences. 
The only problem, the only hole in our system is that our bedroom only has one TV. So at the end of the day, when we tuck the dog in bed and we tuck the girls in bed and we go into our room together, we have to agree on something. Or at the very least, we have to compromise on something. And, and it's a struggle. Last Monday night, we were doing this familiar song and dance. We're having a hard time settling on a show. Um, Lacey and I just have different strategies for unwinding after a long day. I want to watch something silly and lighthearted, something I've seen a bunch of times, something I, something I don't have to invest much energy in. I want to watch, you know, a rerun of The Office. And Lacey wants to unwind with something serious and intense. You know, because in her defense, she spent most of her day with the Paw Patrol and Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and Peppa Pig, so she needs some adult stimulation. And so Lacey wants a, a stern documentary or an intense drama. And so we're, we're going through this song and dance, and I'm, I'm trying to convince her to watch an episode of The Office that we had to have seen ten times already. And Lacey's scrolling through the Netflix queue, and she gets to a show called I'm a Killer. And uh, it's a documentary about killers, basically. They go to death row and they interview murderers to hear their side of the story. And so we were fascinated enough by the concept to watch the trailer. And you see person after person saying, you know, I didn't do it. Here's my side of the story. Let me tell you what really happened. And then about two minutes into the trailer, you get a man that just flat out says, yeah, I killed him. And I'd do it again. I don't even feel bad about it. And then a smile creeps across his face and he starts laughing. And I was very uncomfortable with that concept. Right? I, 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 I couldn't wrap my mind around that. You know, we, this man took a human life and he thought it was funny. And we're, we're captivated by these type of documentaries because they're so far from normal for us. We have a hard time understanding how someone could destroy another human life and feel no remorse or no guilt for his actions. And I think this is the problem we run into when we read Genesis 4. The first problem we run into when we read Genesis 4 is that we've heard this story a hundred million times. But the second problem we run into is that we have a hard time getting into the mindset of a killer. We have a hard time thinking like a murderer. We have a hard time finding our place in the story. And as I've studied this text for the last couple of weeks, that has been the hardest question to answer. Where is our place in the story? And so as we dig into this familiar story this morning, I, I pray that we look at it with new eyes. And I want to answer two questions as we work our way through the text. The first question is this, what can we learn from the fall of Cain? And the second question is, what can we learn about God? Now, the overall subject matter of Genesis 4 is the spread of sin from a family to a society. We see Adam and Eve fall from grace in Genesis 3, and they pass the curse down to their sons, Cain and Abel. And our passage tells the story of Cain walking in rebellion against his brother and against his God. And we see the earth further decline from God's original design. Now, there's a few different ways you could split up these 16 verses but I would say the story of Cain and Abel has three parts. A new beginning, a familiar trap, and a devastating end. And so let's start in verse 1 and let's look at a new beginning. It says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. So the first two verses here paint a picture of a new beginning. After the fall from grace, after the first sin, after death enters the world for the first time, God blesses Adam and Eve with two sons. And Eve recognized the blessing. She says, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. In other words, the Lord created the first man, and now with his help, I have created the second man. Eve acknowledged God as the sovereign giver of life. Her words are filled with hope. We could even say that Eve probably believed that Cain may have been the offspring that God was talking about in Genesis 3.15. As he's punishing the serpent for his role in the fall, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And of course, now we know that the offspring that God is referring to is Jesus through the line of Adam and Eve who would deal a crushing blow to sin and death on the cross. But surely, 
as Eve was holding her baby boy for the first time and dreaming of what he may become, you know the thought crossed her mind, is this boy the one who will make things right? Is this boy the one who will end Satan forever? Is this boy the one that will return our family to God's original design? And so as we see the birth of Cain and Abel, we have a hopeful and optimistic moment. Any parent in the room can relate to this. I'll never forget July 17th, 2014 in Louisville, Kentucky. I won't forget it for two reasons. The first reason was that I looked over the curtain when the doctor said Parker was coming out. That was a rookie mistake. That was a rookie mistake. Lacey was, uh, Parker was breached, and so Lacey had to have a C-section, and so my wife was split open, and there was blood everywhere, and they were grabbing Parker's leg and pulling her out like this, and it was just, it was not, it was not good. Whenever Chandler was born, I just met her after they had dried her off and put her in a blanket. But the other reason I'll never forget that day is when I held Parker for the first time. I, I was flooded with different emotions. I was overwhelmed by her. I was completely overtaken with pride and joy. As I'm holding this beautiful little baby girl, I'm thinking about every mistake that I've ever made in my life. I'm thinking about everything that I've ever done wrong, and I'm just praising God that we did something right. And I just have this highlight reel of boneheaded decisions flashing through my mind, and I start to crumble under the weight and responsibility of having to, to guide, protect, and take care of this tiny human life. And I did the only thing I knew to do. I started to pray for her. And that, that prayer that I prayed on that first day is a pray, prayer that I've continued to pray through the four years of her life. I prayed that she would know Jesus. I prayed that she would be a gospel light. I prayed that she would be as good as her mother and better than me. That's all I wanted for my daughter. That's all I wanted for my second daughter, and that's all I want for my son, is that they would be better than me. That they, that's still what I want for them. And I imagine Adam and Eve wanted the same for their sons. They desperately wanted Cain and Abel to learn from their mistakes. Have you ever considered that Adam and Eve were probably the two greatest evangelists of all time? You know, we, we can share the gospel and we can speak of a future hope in Jesus and we can imagine what it will be like to see God face to face, but Adam and Eve could sit and retell stories about walking with God in the garden. Now, how many times did Adam bounce his boys on his knee and describe the garden? How many times did Eve sit with them at the dinner table and recount its beauty? How many times did they plead with their boys to trust God? How many times did they beg them to place their faith in the promises of God and ignore the promises of Satan? They wanted better for their boys. And Abel took their words to heart, but Cain didn't. Cain fell into a familiar trap for their family. Picking back up in verse 3, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. So in the first two verses, we get this picture of hope, and then we see a little bit of foreshadowing in their occupations. Cain is a tiller of the ground, and Abel is a keeper of the sheep, and there's certainly nothing wrong with either job in the ancient world, but their occupations do give us a slight hint about their place in the world. You know, as the keeper of the sheep, Abel is living out God's original purpose for man to have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air and every other living thing on earth. Abel's walking in God's original design. Abel is living in God's economy. But Cain is a worker of the ground, a worker of the cursed ground. God curses the ground because of Adam's sin, and so Cain's job is harder because, because of the curse. He struggles with soil, which is now more reluctant to yield his fruit, and so his job is a constant reminder of the fall. 
And so we get that little bit of foreshadowing before we jump into verse 3. And then in verse 3, over the next six verses, we see a familiar pattern unfold. You know, last week we talked about, we've been going through the first three chapters and we, we looked at the fall and we saw Satan actively working to get Adam and Eve to call God's rules into question. We see him ask, did God really say? Did God really say that you shouldn't eat of the fruit? And then when they, when they gave him a foothold, he was emboldened to engage them in conversation. He proclaims, surely you will not die. You certainly won't perish from eating one apple. I mean, God isn't telling you the whole story. God is holding back from you. And though Satan isn't directly mentioned in chapter 4, we can see his fingerprints all over Cain. We know he's working behind the scenes. Because Satan knew God's plan. In 3.15, God gives his first gospel message and says that I'm sending offspring through Eve to destroy sin forever. And so he knows the game plan. He knows a savior is coming through the bloodline of Adam and Eve. And so his purpose is to destroy their offspring. If he could terminate their sons, he could keep God's plan from being fulfilled. And so as, Ca as Cain is farming the ground, Satan's whispering in his ear. He's stirring jealousy towards his brother. He's driving him towards anger. And when Cain and Abel bring their offerings to the Lord, Cain's anger hits a boiling point. Cain and Abel both bring offerings as an act of worship, but God clearly favors Abel's offering over Cain's. Scripture says the Lord had regard for Abel, but he had no regard for for Cain. And we can fall into a trap here of thinking that it's about the gifts themselves, but it's not about the gifts, it's about the heart of the giver. And I understand how we can fall into that trap, right? If, you, if one person brings me a Texas Roadhouse gift card for my birthday and another person brings me a fruit basket, I'm going to write thank you cards to both of you, but you know who has my favor, okay? It's the one who gets me closer to eating premium cuts of meat. That's just the reality. So we, we, can, we can think that it's about the gift, but God's approval has nothing to do with the gift itself. It has everything to do with the heart posture of the giver. You see this same idea in Mark 12. Jesus and his disciples are sitting across from the temple treasury, and they're watching people come and give their offerings. And they watch men walking through and just dumping large sums of money into the treasury. And one after another, they're dumping large sums of money. And then a poor widow comes through. All she has to her name are two small copper coins that she can rub together. And Jesus catches her, she catches Jesus' attention. And when she drops those coins into the box, those coins that would be the equivalent of one sixty-fourth of one day's wages, Jesus says to the disciples, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty, has put everything in she had, all she had to live on. And so her smaller gift was more valuable to God because her heart was filled with love for God. Similarly, Abel gives out of gratitude and zeal for God. He goes out of his way to please God. He humbly approaches the altar with the firstborn of his flock. Abel comes to God and understands that he is a sinner, understands that he needs grace. He comes forward in true worship, and God sees his heart, and God has regard for him and his offering. God counted him righteous. But Cain, on the other hand, Cain comes forward with a self-righteous gift to the Lord. Instead of obediently adhering to God's sacrificial requirements for innocent blood, Cain brings the fruit of the ground. He brings general produce. He brings the results of his labor. He doesn't come to the Lord in search of forgiveness. He comes to the Lord in defiance, and God had no regard for Cain and his offering. God counted Cain unrighteous. And God's regard for Abel and his disregard for Cain was directly related to the status of their hearts. But Cain was still angry with God's decision. He burned with jealousy for his brother. He lamented the perceived favoritism from his heavenly father. And God attempted to counsel Cain 
because he knew that Cain was going down a slippery slope, but Cain ignores God's warnings. You know, if the, if the story stopped there, if, if Cain doesn't commit the murder in verse 8, we may have a completely different view of his story. We may have a completely different view of him. Because if we're honest, we have a bad habit of categorizing sin. I have a, a friend who, ever since I've become a pastor, feels like he needs to confess all of his sins to me. I've explained to him multiple times that we're not Catholic and that he can just bypass me and go straight to God with whatever he needs to ask forgiveness for. But he, he feels better to use me as a sounding board. And so he, he tells me all the things that are going on in his life and all the ways that he has fallen short. And these conversations often follow a, a similar pattern. He'll admit to a bad decision. And then to make himself feel better, he'll tell me a story about a friend or acquaintance who made a worse decision to, to even things out. So he'll, he'll feel a little bit better about his life, right? He'll say, well, I did this, but at least I didn't do this, right? I've kind of fallen off the wagon, and, and I've, I've, I've went out, and I've gotten drunk a few times in the last month and made a fool of myself, but I have this other friend who got a DUI and I would never drink and drive, right? He has to temper that sin with someone else's sin to feel better. And, and, and when we're wrestling with sin, we can fall into this trap of comparison. And we can say, hey, lust isn't adultery. Covening isn't stealing. Greed isn't gluttony. And lying isn't cheating. And anger isn't murder. And we start to formulate a ranking system for our sins, and we let ourselves off the hook for our shortcomings. But Jesus corrects our hypocrisy in the Sermon on the Mount. He says that even if Cain was only angry, he's still liable to judgment. He said, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. The reality is all sin is equally dangerous because all sin is equally capable of separating us from God. All sin is equally capable of leading to our destruction. And so God saw Cain walking a hazardous path and he tries to reach out to him. He tries to show compassion for him. He says, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? Obviously God knows the answer. Obviously, God is employing a tactic that we as parents use all the time. Parker, why are you angry? I'll ask the question, but I just saw Chandler go streaking by and steal a toy. I know what went down. I saw the whole scene. But I still ask, why are you angry? Because I want her little wheels to spin about why she is getting angry at her sister. I want her to consider, is it really so bad to share with your sister? Is it really so bad for your sister to enjoy a toy that you weren't using anymore? And God tries to do the same thing with Cain. He tries to get him to wrestle with the source of his anger. And then God offered Cain a second chance, an opportunity to turn from his sin, an opportunity to do the right thing before it's too late. He says, if you do well, will you be accepted? If you do well, I'll accept you. I didn't, I didn't reject your offering based on my personal preference. I didn't reject your offering based on the quality of your produce. I rejected your offering because your heart isn't for me. You know, and God isn't advocating a, a gospel of good works here. He isn't telling Cain, hey, if you just bring a better offering next week, we'll be good. He's encouraging Cain to search his soul. He's saying, remember my promises. He's prompting him to consider his unending grace. He's begging him to accept his unconditional love. But Cain is uninterested in self-evaluation. He's growing more and more comfortable in his rebellion, and he's starting to spiral out of control. So God offers him a firm warning. He said, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. God personified sin as an animal and he said it was crouching at the door and its, its desire is to devour us. There's an old 
sermon illustration about a man who has two dogs. One of the dogs represents our spirit and the other dog represents our flesh. And, and the story goes that whichever dog we feed will grow the strongest. If we're continually throwing bones to our flesh, if we're continually throwing bones to our sinful nature, it will grow stronger and stronger. And so we have to step back and evaluate what is stirring our affections for Jesus and what in our life is moving us away from Jesus. And Cain's a prime example of giving Satan a foothold and tossing his sinful nature a bone over and over again. He ignored God's warnings. He refused to repent, and he allowed his sin to pounce. And in verse 8, he invites his brother out in the field. And as soon as they're alone, he rises up, he strikes him, and he kills him right there. If we don't master our sin, we give our sin an opportunity to master us. You know, Adam and Eve, just a few years before this, had to be talked into their sin by Satan. And now their son Cain couldn't be talked out of his sin by God. The curse was alive and well in the second generation. Then in verse 9, the Lord confronts Cain and he says, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength. You shall be a fugitive, a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord to settle in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And so our story concludes here with a devastating end. A story that began hopefully. A story that began optimistically. Ends seeing Cain going away from the presence of the Lord. And in the final eight verses here, we see God interrogate and punish Cain for his rebellion. He starts by asking him, where is your brother? Now, once again, God knows the answer to the question, but he's trying to give Cain every opportunity to confess. He's trying to give him every opportunity to repent. If he would just humbly come before the Lord in repentance, God would have restored him. And we see this in 2 Samuel 12. David walks a similar sin spiral with Bathsheba. You know, he's not off at war, and, and he, he looks out, and he sees her bathing on the rooftop, and he, he lusts for her, and he commits adultery with her. When she becomes pregnant, he goes into full cover-up mode. He tries to bring her husband home from war, hoping that he'll lay with her, and it'll muddy the water and muddy the timeline. When that doesn't work, he just sends the husband of the front line to be killed. And he takes Bathsheba as his wife. And David moved in, in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel from lust to adultery to deceit to murder. He followed a very similar path. And when God confronted him in chapter 12 with, with his sin through the prophet Nathan, David broke down in repentance. He admitted his mistakes, he admitted his shortcomings, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says right after that, the Lord has put away your sins. The God who forgave David was certainly willing to forgive Cain. If he would have showed any regret or guilt for his transgressions, God would have forgiven him too. But he just kept lying. He said, I don't know. He denied any knowledge of his brother's location and then he added a little smart aleck comment and he said am I my brother's keeper um, Cain's question is a play on words because Abel was the keeper of the sheep he's asking God am I required to be the keeper of the keeper you know we don't have a sarcasm font in our translations but it's pretty clear that Cain's laying it on thick here his attitude of indifference jumps off the page Cain had no regard for his little brother but God did 
The Lord said to him, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. You know, God has tried and tried to give Cain an opportunity to right the ship, but since Cain has been completely unrepentant, God moved to judgment. And he passed down a severe punishment to Cain. First, God placed a curse on Cain. He placed a curse on the productivity of any soil that he attempted to till. He said, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength. In Genesis 3, we see God universally curse the ground to make it more difficult to farm. In Genesis 4, we see God specifically curse any ground that Cain attempted to farm to make it impossible for him to do his job. You know, aside from a death sentence, this punishment was the worst possible scenario for Cain. He became a farmer who was unable to farm. And then the Lord banished him from his presence, said, you shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain no longer had a home. He no longer had a family. He no longer had favor with his heavenly father. He was banished to walk aimlessly through the earth the rest of his days. And when Cain hears this sentence, he exclaims, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And some scholars believe at this point that Cain's words have a repentant tone. That maybe Cain is starting to see the gravity of his actions, but I don't think that's true. I don't think any previous text or following text gives us any indication that Cain ever showed remorse for his actions. More than likely, he was just expressing his displeasure with God's punishment. When he said, my punishment is greater than I am bare, he's essentially saying, you've got to be kidding me, God. I make a few mistakes. I kill that goody two-shoes brother of mine, and you destroy my livelihood completely. You cast me out. You send me to go live in exile because of three sins. This isn't fair. This isn't fair. This punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, Cain knew his punishment would put him in constant danger because he was no longer able to provide for himself. His only hope for survival was to steal food from others. His new life as a scavenger would put him at odds with other people. And he feared that eventually someone would murder him in his wandering. But even after everything that happened, God extended a little bit of common grace to Cain. God said, not so. And God put a mark on Cain's head so that no one would harm him. He offered Cain his divine protection. He mercifully gave it to him. And our story ends in verse 16. It says, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And so we see our story move from a new beginning to a familiar trap to a devastating end. And so how does this story apply to us? I want to circle back to those two questions that we asked from the beginning and I want to give you a couple points of application from the story of, of Cain and Abel. The first question was, what can we learn from the fall of Cain? So over the last couple weeks as I've been studying this passage, there's one uh, statement from God that has stuck with me every single day. It's when God is warning Cain and he says, sin is crouching at the door. You know, Cain's downfall provides a stark look at the threat of sin. And I think it's very easy for us to look at this story and, and I think that many of us have never considered for a moment murdering someone. And so it's easy for us to separate us, separate ourselves from the story and say, yeah, Cain's bad, don't be like Cain, well, I'm never going to murder anybody, so I'm fine. But we can't forget that Cain's transgression started with jealousy, that he was just jealous of the golden child. And then jealousy moved to anger, and then anger moved to murder, and then murder moved to cover up. It all started with him just being jealous of his little brother. When Satan was done with him, he was a murderer, and he was separated from God forever. And so the first thing we can learn from Cain is that we can't downplay our sin. 
We can't cover up our sin. We can't ignore our sin. We can't give Satan a foothold. We have to be intentional about going to battle with our sin every day. And we'll never be perfect, but we should be able to look back at our spiritual journey and see a pattern of spiritual growth as we have grown into the image of Christ. That's what we can learn from Cain. Your sins are different than Cain's, but you still have sin. Second, what can we learn about God? Simply, that he's always faithful. In Genesis 3.15, God gives that first gospel message. He, He gives Adam and Eve a glimmer of hope in a dark day in human history, and he says, I am sending someone to make this right. I'm sending Jesus to die on the cross to make this right. And from that point, Satan actively worked to prevent the offspring of Adam and Eve from fulfilling God's promise. He moved Cain to kill Abel. He moved the Hebrew boy, he moved the Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrew boys in Exodus 1 and 2. He moved Saul to kill David in 1 Samuel 18. He moved Herod to kill Jesus in Matthew 2. But Satan failed every single time. And at the end of Genesis 4, we see that Adam and Eve have another son named Seth. And through Seth came Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who died a sinner's death, who defeated the grave on the third day, and who is currently sitting at the right hand of God, calling sinners to himself even now. So in a vacuum, this story of Cain and Abel can be depressing. Like, it's been a rough week for me. I'm, I've, I had to move my house, which I hate to do, and I had to study Cain and Abel in depth, so it's been a struggle. I know in a vacuum how just depressing this story can be. But we have to step back and see the big picture. We have to step back and see God's redemptive story in full, and we have to understand that Abel's murder was foreshadowing for the coming of Jesus. That Abel's blood was foreshadowing for the blood of Christ, whose blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And while Abel's innocent blood cried out for justice against sin, Jesus' innocent blood cried out for mercy for sinners. While Abel's blood exposed Cain and his his wretchedness, Jesus' blood covers our wretchedness and cleanses us from all sin. Even in a story as dark as Cain and Abel, there's good news. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. You know, we're probably more, there's probably more Cain in us than we're probably willing to admit. And so, Lord, we're thankful for your redemptive plan to send Jesus to make a way for sinners. We're thankful that he came to earth so that we could have a seat at your table. And, Father, today I hope that we wrestle with all the ways that we fall short of your standard. And, Father, if there's any person under the sound of my voice who who is wrestling with a particular sin, Lord, I I hope that you would encourage them and remind them that the grace of Jesus is enough to cover any multitude of sins. And Father, I pray they would move during this time of invitation. They would make it right, and they wouldn't carry it with them through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we come to a time of invitation, the invitation is simple. In this story, as, as Cain's sin started to grow larger and larger and larger, God gave him ample opportunities to turn from his sin. This morning, we want to offer you the same opportunity. If you've never placed your trust in Jesus, we, we want to invite you to do that this morning. Um, and if you have, and you have sin in your life that's causing a rift between you and your Heavenly Father, I would encourage you to Come to this altar and pray. Leave it here this morning and don't take it with you out of this room. And if you want to join our church, we'd certainly welcome you to do that as well. And so as Logan comes to sing,
We ask you to respond as God leads you to respond and do it right now. Would you stand and sing with us? There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for your word and the story of Cain and Abel. Father, I pray that we go and we understand that sin is real and that you are faithful. And through our repentance, Lord, you are there. And Father, I pray that we understand that we there's hope and that we, if life beats us up, things that are going on in our life, Lord, that you're faithful, always. Father, that's in Jesus' precious name, amen.